take your time, because whatever time you take, you take it from Shelby, so then you just take it up with her, all right? But uh, can we give Trevor a good hand? Sorry, honey, if I take away any time. I uh, wanted to point out, Nancy, welcome back. Yeah. Woo! I don't know if you know this, but Nancy gets down. She parties hard. Don't let her age fool you. She's hilarious. She's shaking her head, but she'll be doing this. And Herb, it's always great to see you and hear from you. Herb is an awesome, funny guy and a straight shooter. Reminds me of my fiance. I'm the party one. But hello, my name is Trevor. Pleasure to meet all of you and see all of you again. If this is your first time here, welcome. And if this is your second or third or hundredth time, glad we haven't scared you, welcome back. And uh, today's a little different. So I get to work for as a missionary here in California, so not too far. But what's something that's really cool is your church likes to support missionaries. And so when they do that, the missionary gets to come on stage in full transparency and say, hey, this is what I'm about, this is what we do. And so I get to say, this is what I'm about, this is what I do. And before I jump into that, I, I think something that's important to know is that when you are in ministry, make sure you're called. And so I want to give you a little snapshot of like, of why I believe I'm called here. This isn't just an accident, this isn't just something that was like, hey, go try this thing and you'll be great because missionaries and ministry workers make millions of dollars. And <laughs> you're gonna be great, you're gonna be fine. I'm doing it for the money, I hope you know that. If you're not laughing, I, there's not a lot of money left. Anyway, um, so a little snapshot of me. I'm from San Diego, California, and I came here to the gem of the West, the Desto. Uh, excuse me, this is serious, so, but yes. So I'm from San Diego. I got recruited to go play football at San Jose State, so I got to play Division I D-line football a couple pounds ago, and it was awesome. I loved it. My whole identity was, is, was, was football, and sports was all I ever did because that's how people love me, that's what I got attention for, that's how I was gonna get a girlfriend, and that's how I was gonna make millions of dollars. And so it was, it was going great. I got a bunch of awards my freshman year, standing out, all this good stuff, and then something changes. I have a relationship with Jesus my first year of college. I'm actually involved in a church, I'm involved with a, with a group of guys that are interested in learning more about the Bible like I am, and they're a little more seasoned and veteran. And so they're helping me read it, and I'm just coming along verse after verse, and I'm just realizing, man, I'm not living for the Lord for whatever reason. Like, just something's attacking me, and little that I know is the Holy Spirit just ambushing me, just waiting. And so what, I, what happens, long story short, is I end up leaving the football team. I end up saying goodbye, a bunch of different reasons, but the main thing was uh, after reading Romans and talking with a lot of people, Romans 12.1 says, Therefore, brothers and sisters, offer your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. If you're an athlete, if you've ever seen an athlete, if you even have a profession that you love, you know what it's like to put your full body on the line. You know what it's like to give 100%. Absolutely. And I realized, man, I'm not doing that at all with God. And he's real. And Jesus is real. And what Jesus did for us on the cross is real. And if no one, and people don't know about that. So I need to go do something about that. And so I end up going on this awesome long journey. Ooh, I'm going to skip a couple years too. I get to meet Shelby. I've been in youth ministry for seven years. I've got to travel a couple different places. And a convicting thing for me was I wanted to go out in the world and preach Jesus and talk to people that didn't know him. But I realized, man, I could raise all the support, go to another country, and that's needed. That's very much needed. But I just realized in my heart, man, if I'm a... If I'm on the outside looking into California or the United States, people need to send missionaries here, and they do. So I know the culture, I know the language, and I speak sports. And so, little, so I meet, I get to meet this wonderful, wonderful woman, Shelby, on a dating app called Upward, not Tinder, Upward. <laughs> I had to say it, honey. And so, she's great, and the first thing she talks about is her students. She loves her students. And I'm like, I love students too. You wanna get married? No. <laughs> It's that easy, everyone, it's that easy. <laughs> and so we, we get to talking and, and more and more, and I get to see her heart pursued, she gets to see mine, and we're like, man, we're gonna make such a great team. Cause she's really good at details, and I'm big vision. So we, we compliment each other in so many ways, and we're so grateful. And so that's also, she's part of the ministry too, and helping, and I'm part of her ministry. And so we're doing it together, cause family ministry comes first. And so we're very excited for that. And now getting to the part of SCA. Okay, here we go. 
So here I am, where I know this is a couple months ago, I know I'm gonna be moving out here, because we, we planned it, we prayed, we're like, God, are you sure it's not San Diego? Are you sure it's not the Caribbean? Are you sure? Like, that'd be pretty cool. Modesto, Central Valley, got it, okay, cool, go over here. And so we, we go over here, and I'm looking at FCA, because I, cause part of ministry is knowing God, knowing people, bringing them together. And I've heard about FCA, and I know it was a sports ministry, and I'm like, I know sports. I know people, I know God, I can bring all that together. And so I started looking online, nothing was available. She meets my now boss at an FCA golf tournament. He goes up to her and says, hey, he's like six foot seven, huge. Hey, you wanna work for FCA? And uh, she says, well, no, but my boyfriend would love to. And so anyway, I get his contact information and I was looking online and there was no job postings. The closest thing was Lodi which I found out was far, because I didn't know what the Central Valley <laughs> entailed, the Bay Area, that's where I was raised. Nah, that's where I was for seven years. So come over here, be, I'm part of SCA, talking to him, I'm like, man, I'm in. And as I was leaving, I had three other ministries that I was helping run and support, and all those were being taken care of, and those were huge prayer requests for mine, so I never, part of my heart is, I don't want to leave things worse than I found them, I want to leave them better, and so that's also the person that's helping lead this ministry. And so now we get to the part of SCA. So I hear about FCA, love it, and this is now what I get to do. So I've, I've accepted the job, and it's 100% support raised. Like I said, we're in it for the money. And so it's 100% support raised. And the, the really cool part about FCA is that they don't just say, all right, go, go do your thing. They actually push through training. And the first part about that training is the biblical part. Because you can't do what the Lord's calling you to do unless it's not biblically rooted. You can't do what, you're gonna, what you want to do unless it's biblically rooted. So... So they, they talk about the support raising aspect and they go Old Testament, New Testament, because that's the whole Bible. And they talk about these, these people called the Levites. The Levites, there were 12 tribes and the Levites were the 12th, right? Yeah, okay, cool. Ooh. Okay, and they were the 12th tribe. And their job wasn't to go off to war. Their job wasn't to go and do these things. Their job was to be the priest tribe, to be the, the church tribe, so to speak. And so they didn't, they didn't go and get all this stuff. Their, their job was to rely on the other 11 tribes for what they're going to go do. And so here I am in this tribe that I wasn't born into, but I'm so, so I'm going to choose to, to go into. And so that's, that's part of an Old Testament. And then Paul talks about it. Jesus talks about it. But we get, we get training. And what I love about my boss is he never asked me how the ministry is going. He's asked, he always asks, how shall we do because, because marriage is important, because marriage is important, because you want to have a healthy family to have a healthy ministry. And that's, that's what they really care about, and they care about leader development. He always asks, how are you reading your Bible? Are you in the Word? Are you praying? Hey, how can we come alongside you? It's very much like, how can we serve you and help build you up? And he knows that impacts the ministry, but, he's, but it's a very much personal, relational ministry. So that's why I really, really love it, too. And then here's the really fun part I get to do. So here's the, what the ministry is about. It's about coaches, athletes, and ministering to them, and by the power of Jesus, influencing them to share the gospel. Because we all know coaches and athletes. We all know at least one, right? And coaches will speak to more people in their life than a lot of us. They have new teams coming in every year, and it's changing. And so what I put in my ministry is supporting them, supporting the coach, because they have a huge responsibility to our community and to raising young men and young women in the right values, in the right setting. And sports is a vehicle, it's not, the, it's not the everything, it's not your life, it is a vehicle to help teach you about life and help build in your relationship with Jesus. And Paul's very clear about that too, by the way. But my, part of my ministry is ministering to those coaches. And a huge thing that Satan likes to do is he likes to attack the marriage, he likes to attack the family. And so we've seen a lot of influx in divorces with coaches. 60% of coaches' are, coaches' relationships are ending in divorce. And so what part of my ministry gets to do here in Stanislaus County, and that's a big county, is we get to do Coach Val State Nights. And so we set up food for them. Like this is just an event we recently did. Set up food for them. We bring in a couple that's... Um, a Christian couple that's he's been coaching for 20 years they've been married for 30 and we just do a little Q&A hey how is it like being away from your family for so long hey how was it like you having kids what did you need to do differently how was it like having God in the midst of that and sharing that with coaches that are believers and aren't believers 
and seeing that, okay, Christians aren't crazy, they're actually really cool, and that they actually have something of value to offer this world. And, and so it's just, it just takes an invite. And so we had 22 couples there, so that's 11. That was the first time we did this. And so I've only been here for a month and a half, and so I'm seeing more and more people interested in wanting to come, and it's been really cool. And I have more information on my table in the back, and I'll talk about that later. But we offer a lot of other things to coaches and spouses because we want to help support them and the, and the ministry of their family and helping lead coaches in a relationship with Jesus. And so as we know that coaches have a big influence because if you've had a coach, you know there's the one that you would jump through a wall for, and there's the one that you would just never listen to or you hated going to them. Anyway, they both need Jesus, long story short. And so that's why I come in, and I want every coach – in the area to have my number because I see myself as a chaplain for them, to pray for them, to love them, and to see what they need so I can be there at the moment's notice. And so that's coaches. And then here comes the other part, campuses. So what I get to do is I get to start Christian clubs on campuses. Coolest job. There's a catch. There's 70 campuses. There's one of me. So omnipresence is not my gift yet. I've been asking for a long time. It's not there yet. And so what that, what that means is we actually have a couple campuses that are, that are already set up. We have Houston, Oakdale. Kaylee's actually here. She's one of the student leaders, and so she's doing a really awesome job. And so she's a student leader, and it's student-led, and it's also teacher-led. So we need one teacher, and we just need one student, and we have our club. And in this club, we engage students, we empower them. Excuse me, we engage students, we equip students, and we empower them because everyone has a gift. And we know that education and education, that students just need a little education. They need to know that they have a gift, that they can use it, and hey, here's a way you can use it. Here's SCA. SCA is not the end-all be-all, but it is a tool that we're going to leverage to share about Jesus through the avenue of sports. Because hey, you might come for basketball, but you're going to stay for the food and for the gospel. So, but... What I love about Kaylee and I love about students like her is that she, they're, they're all in for what FCA stands for, and that is that sports aren't the idol. We love Jesus, and we're going to use sports and invite students that love sports to share about Jesus. And she's awesome. She's very gifted. That's all I'm going to say. I'm not going to embarrass you anymore, Kaylee. <laughs> but it's really cool. It's hard not to talk about it because these students are great. And what FCA gets to do is I get to empower the, the adult, the coach, or the teacher that's running that huddle pour into them and they pour into the student. And that's where I'm gonna be setting up, but I need to make sure I'm going to these campuses and helping run them in a certain way. So I'm just bringing a little bit of organization, a little bit of structure so that we, this thing can grow and it can be what God wants it to be. Yeah. Amen. And, and God doesn't need me to do it. That's just very true. He can do whatever he wants, but I'm so glad I get to be a tool that's used for him. Yeah. And so I have gifts, he's given me those, and I get to go use them for him. Yeah. And so, as I'm going on these campuses, here's the coolest part. I'm not the church. I mean, we are the church, right? But I'm not actually the church. SC is not the church. You're the church. This is the church. I'm the ambulance. We can help someone stay, you know, beep, beep, beep. But the church is where they have surgery. The church is where they come to get discipled. They get to meet awesome people like you because you have something to offer students. You do. Don't shake your heads. Oh, I never, I never could do youth ministry. You could. Maybe. Ask God. Anyway, you're welcome, honey. But, but so we're, we're the ambulance. So what we, that means is I get to, we get to invite youth pastors and pastors onto campuses. So having like five or six pastors come onto campus, and they're coming to one of these huddles. So we call them a huddle. We have, we have them at least once a month to twice, depending on the school. And so what that means is we're going to have pizza there or some kind of food. There's going to be a speaker there that either played sports or didn't. And they're going to talk about playing for God's glory. They're going to talk about you're more than just an athlete. And they're going to talk about their identity in Christ and how it's not rooted in sports, but that sports is the avenue in which they become a better man, a better woman to glorify God. And that they can glorify God in the sports that they are playing because God gave them a gift and they're giving them the opportunity to share. So anyway, and in that, we get to bring those pastors along and they're in the background. Shelby goes to the Houston huddle all the time and she's engaging. She's talking with students. And she recently didn't know that they're supposed to do more than just her. Because she's only one youth pastor. And someone might live in Turlock or something. Anyway, my job is to bring all those youth pastors and pastors onto campus so that they can know a student. And that that student could have a discipleship or a relationship with a church. Because I'm not the church. You're the church. And I want to bring as many students as I can to church. 
I'm a bridge. So that's a really cool part about huddles, and there's more I can go into, but it's coaches, it's the campuses, and we already have a, a, a couple going on, and I've already talked with multiple coaches who are like, hey, like we're, we're in. What do we do? And so there's a system and there's a process for student leaders, and if you want to be a huddle coach, because we're not just, I'm not asking Joe Schmo, who like, hey, I just became a believer yesterday. What do I do? Okay, well, let's get you into church, and let's build you up, and I want you to come. I want you to be a leader, just not yet. Because there's, there's, a, there's, a there's a process, and I'm not just going to ask anybody, because there's standards, and those standards are good. They're not there to say you're a bad person. They're there to say, hey, we want to build you up, but we want to make sure we're on the right page. So, and in part of that, I get to go to other churches. So if you ever see me leave in church, if you ever see me here not on a Sunday, or I'm not here on a Wednesday, I love you, all of you. I love Pastor Chris. I'm not leaving a sermon. It's because I, because part of my due diligence is I need to go check out some of the other churches because there's like over 100 in the whole Stanislaus County. There's like at least three to one school church ratio. And so part of my due diligence is going to the youth groups, going to the churches, and finding student leaders from in their campuses or on their church and starting camp and starting huddles on these different campuses. So if I'm not here, think the best of me. I'm, I'm not cheating on you, by the way. I'm not, this is my home church, with the record show, but I do need to do my due diligence so I'm making sure when I invite a youth pastor or a pastor, hey, come to our campus, that, you know, they're not over there. So they're not super crazy. Like, oh, we're Mormons. And so we even have a lot of conversations there. But there's just, there's differences. And making sure they're gospel-centered and focused. So I have to do my due diligence. And there's a long list of churches. And so just want to be transparent there. And so anyway, we talked about coaches, talked about campuses. And now we talk about camps. So what do we do during the summer? Because there's no school. We're not going to do something during summer school. Okay? But we have camps. And so... You just heard uh, a couple weeks ago, a long time ago, uh, about Hume Camp from some of the students, and they gave a testimony. And it was so cool because when, you're, when you go to camp, it takes you out of the everyday yeah. mundaneness of life, and it presents you with a fresh view of the gospel. This is who Jesus is, and you can live for him. Uh -huh. And so we have a lot of athletes, and they like to go to the sports camp. So we do sports camps. We have a football camp. That's for all of May at Hume every single weekend, and over 1,400 players and coaches are going to go there. They're going to learn about football, and they're going to learn about Christ. We have chapel. We have Bible studies, and they're going to come to all of them. And they're going to learn what it means to be a team, and they're going to learn what it means to be a Christ-focused team. And so now you have a coach that's also seeing, and a player that's also seeing, healthy families. You're seeing, hey, that, like a dad and a mom, and they love Jesus together. How do I have that one day? And they're, and they're engaging and they're meeting people because it's all relationships. And so we're, we're just trying to provide things and give enough ammunition to someone for them to see Christians are like this. There's, there's something here. And so, and then once, say someone then becomes a believer at camp, I want to dedicate my life. We recently just had an event, 40 out of 40 students like dedicated their life to the Lord. And this wasn't in my county, it was a different one, but they had a, just a football camp and they're like, I, I want this. So then where do they go? They go back to the campus. Hey, where, how, do I, how do I go to a church? Well, hey, come to our huddle. There's going to be five youth pastors there. You can meet them. And so it's just this healthy ecosystem of we're going to pour into the coach. We're going to pour into the campus. We're going to set some stuff up for them to go to. Where they get to hear about Jesus. They come to campus, and they're still hearing about Jesus on campus. Because we're that, we're that bridge because a youth pastor can't just come to and just speak whatever they want to on campus. They have to be affiliated somehow. So that's, that's the service we get to offer. And lastly, community. All of this impacts the community. And just from talking with all these coaches, all these teachers, pastors, they're seeing an influx, just a total influx of, hey, we want to start something. Hey, can we come alongside you in this? I mean, my phone keeps blowing up, and I keep having to apologize to my fiance about being on my phone so much because people are in on FCA here, and I've only been here a month and a half. And so my, my prayer is starting to turn to, Lord, I pray that the churches can receive all these influx of people because it's happening and it's going great and it's so cool. And that's just in Stanislaus County. That's just our county, which is, there's over 70 schools. You go from elementary to college. So it's a big gap. And part of the community service I get to do, that was also a prayer was, Shelby and I were praying, and I would just love to be more part of the community. 
I know what that meant, but I even used the word chaplain. I don't know what that is. I don't ask for it. And so, Lord, I'd just love to do that. And I was talking with a friend about the Modesto Nuts. I told him I don't know anything about baseball. And then that was followed up with a text I get from a random number that said, hey, we're looking for a chaplain for the Modesto Nuts. Can we talk? I'm like, sure. Cool, God. That was really weird and creepy. But I mean, I love it. Because you do those things. And so now I get to be the chaplain for the Modesto Nuts. So if I ever leave... I know, it's super cool. So if I ever leave on a Sunday, I'm not, it's not because of Pastor Chris's teaching or bad jokes. It's, <laughs> I mean, maybe, I don't know, I might leave five minutes early, but it's because I get to go minister to those baseball players, and let me tell you, they are hungry. It's so cool. Like, I'm talking with the managers, I'm talking with the players, I'm talking with the staff that are there, and I literally just gave out two Bibles, because I needed because I needed Bibles to give these guys, and some of them don't have Bibles. Some of them are curious, and I literally had, like, a long discussion with someone about, I've been reading the book of Enoch, and I've been reading about Doubting Thomas. These are not like part of the Bible, and like, I had to go into a deep conversation. Anyway, I'm adding that part to tell you that people are curious. They're trying to fill their life with something, and if we don't step in front of them and say, hey, let me invite you to church, because it's just an invite, they're, they're going to look for something. They're going to fill it with something else. And so they, they all have my number, and I get to be a part of their life every Sunday, and I just got the okay from the manager to do more things with them. And hopefully we get to do something. I thought the nuts thing was behind me. Uh, and so hopefully we get to do something when y'all get to come to a Modesto Nuts game. I'll be there too. And so anyway, God's doing some yeah. awesome, awesome stuff. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And so here's where this all kind of circles back to. It's not free. It's not free. So the food that people come for is not free. The gas I get to spend driving to Oakdale and then driving all the way to Turlock. And so... Part of that is relying on the body of Christ. I'm not asking for handouts, but I'm asking for a partnership. Because I, I mean, I wouldn't want to actually have, I'd be really cool to have a million dollars, but I actually almost wouldn't want that because the cool thing about this is, is that when I invite people to be a part of the team, there's also an investment. They also get to hear, they also get to want to be a part of what's going on here in Stanislaus County, whether that's financially, because some people are way too busy. And I get, I get to talk with a lot of people like, hey, I have zero time. I wish I, could get to, I wish I could do some in ministry, but here's what I'm doing to support my family. I'd like to support you too because I love the work you're doing. And so whatever camp you fall into, I recently, not recently, but one of the first people that wanted to join my team was a guy named Matthew. He was a part of SCA, and he got me on a campus. And this campus I got to, it was a very dark campus. Churches were not really allowed on there, but SCA was. Go figure. I began, became a coach there. I then got to start a Bible study there. 30 players and coaches were coming to the Bible study. We got to have a talk about relationships at that. And the coach was there, and he did none of what I was saying, because he recently got married, and I was like, you shouldn't live with your spouse before you get married. It's not what you do. I'm like, Please don't fire me, coach. Um, <laughs> and, I, and I had that part, because I wasn't even working for FCA there, but he saw, he, he then came up to me afterwards and was like, see you tomorrow. Show can be fired. But he then endorses it afterwards. And this is like, they have pride flags going on everywhere. They have anything but, but Christianity flags. And they're just, and there's a lot of Mormons too that come. But I, and I told them the differences, and they still came. And I told them my views, like the Bible, here's what it says. And people that even were LGBTQ wanted to come because they were like, this, there's something you're saying that's not part of my life. And so the coach endorsed it so much, he. He came back the next day at campus, didn't tell, didn't tell me anything. He told all the players to go to this. And he said, what do you need? How can I support you? Because I brought food every week. And so even coaches were starting to pitch in. And I had some coaches even starting to speak. And I haven't even joined SCA yet. And so there's three things that I, I want to ask. So whether it's financially you'd like to support, that is an option. I'm looking to raise $1,000 in monthly donors for the whole month of May. Because I, I need to reach at least 3500 to have stable living, you know, because I also need to eat. Um, I'd like that. And even Jesus says, you know, a worker's worth his wages. And so I'm looking to raise $1,000 for monthly recurring donors. And I'm looking for people that would like to use that, that would like to join a prayer team. So back there, there is on the little desk, there's a prayer team. There's your name, your number, your email. And I can't do what I do without prayer. Before I came up here, before I even started my day, 
I asked my prayer team, hey, I'm about to speak at a church. Pray for me to not say something stupid. Um, but, but in all actuality, I just was praying. I said, hey, I'm going to speak here. Please pray for me. Because I can't do what I do without prayer. Because the prayer team is honestly more important than the financial team. Because yeah. our God is, he's, he's not really concerned about wealth or anything. He kind of invented it. And he has cattle on a thousand hills. And he's not too worried about the different things. We will be, but he's solid. And when we go to him in prayer, he does hear us. Prayers are answered. And they're answered in a way that he says they should be answered, not the way I should want them answered. Praise God for that. So there's there's financial, there's there's prayer team, and those can be, you know, you can do both. And there's the third one. You all have a gift. I was talking about the students and how they have gifts, but we all have gifts here, whether you're serving at the church or whether you'd like to help come to a huddle and just up or see what we do, or even talk about joining staff. I'm only one person right now. Um, but even talking about joining staff, but also maybe you're gifted in speaking. Maybe you're gifted in discipleship. Maybe you're gifted in all these different things. If you're just interested, or if you would like to continue this conversation, there's a little sheet on the back, and I think there's two. There's one, but there is a blank page on the back. Anyway, I'd love to sit down with you, talk one-on-one -on -one with you, and if you have more questions, I'm, I'm free. I'd love to get to know you more, and I'd love to get to more, know more people in this church. And so part of that is building relationships. I'd love for you to support what I'm doing. And I'm going to leave with this last story just to give you a little bit more of what my heart is because we haven't actually, you don't know me very well, and I want you to, and I want to get to know you too. Um, I recently mentioned Matthew. He worked with FCA. He's the one that got me on campus. He is currently married. He just moved to the East Coast. He's in law school. And he loves, and we, we had a really good friendship, and so it's hard that he's over there. He, he's not giving a lot. He's given very little because of what his finances are going towards. But his heart was so cool and so blessed. And I asked him if I could share this. He said yes. He, he was, I was more happy about what he gave because I know his financial situation. Because that's what God cares about. And that's the conversation we had was, hey, he said, hey, I'm sorry I can't really give a lot. Like, I don't actually have a lot to give. But I want to give to you because I know what this is about. And I know what you're about. And I love the two together. And his heart was, was just so beautiful in that. And that's what God cares about most. And so whether you'd like to join the team or not, I'm just, I really care about your heart. And I want to show you that part of my side. And if anyone ever does want to join staff, I care about the staff members that I would be pouring into in their heart. And God cares about your heart and your, in the posture of that. And so that's the last thing I'll give. So again, financially, prayerfully, gift-wise. I'd like to talk more. I have all that stuff in the back. And so that's all I really have to say. I'm going to invite my fiance up. You did great, yeah? yeah. Good job, honey. Yes. <laughs> my mom thinks it's funny that I call him honey. She's like, you sound like you're like older because you call him honey. And I'm like, mm, I don't know. He's sweet, you know, so that's fine. Okay. I'm so glad that Trevor was able to speak to you guys this morning. Um, yeah, it was really cool when we met his boss. His boss's name, his name is Ron, but we call him Pup, Pup Nelson. And so when I met him, he came up to me. He's like, hey, we're looking for a director for Stanislaus County. Would you be interested? I'm like, no. But my fiance is like 6'5 and played D1 football. He'd be perfect. And here we are. And as soon as, man, when you're praying for the Lord to answer something, he will. Because we're like, Lord, we know you called us here, but, like, um, he doesn't have a job. Like, what do you want him to do, you know? And God's like, I gotcha. And the thing is, I went to that um, golf tournament, and I wasn't really even going to go. And I ended up going to it because I was helping at the Houston FCA, and they were like, we need to go do this, we need to serve, and just myself and the uh, president went, and we didn't even want to go. And we went, and we were obedient, and we served the Lord, and Trevor was blessed because of our obedience. And so the Lord will honor your obedience. When he calls you to something, he needs you to take a step and walk a little bit after you've prayed, and then he'll be able to answer you. So, yes, I'm so glad Trevor was able to um, talk to you guys, but now I get to talk to you guys and bring the word. Is the password the normal password? <laughs> Sorry, this is for the slides. It's okay. 
<laughs> it is. It's the normal password. It is. <laughs> Sorry. Well, yeah, I knew what it was. Okay. Um, bum, bum, ba -dum, ba -dum, ba -dum. <laughs> Which one? I'm gonna say. I need help. I'm sorry. <laughs> this is what happens when the youth pastor gets to speak. Things don't go perfect, uh, and we're good with that. God doesn't call us to be perfect. Oh, awesome. There it is, yeah. Woo, we're starting. Okay, thank you, Jesus. I'm going to pray. You guys good with that? Okay. Father God, I just pray that uh, this would be your sermon. God, that these would be your words. Lord, you know what everyone's heart needs to receive, Father God, and I pray they would receive it. I pray that their hearts would be good soil, God, that these would take root, God. They wouldn't just be uh, just on, on their hearts, God, but they'd go deep. And Lord, I just pray that this would change the way that we live, the way that we praise you, the way that we speak to you, Father God, and the way that we love you. Lord, uh, this is your service. This is your church, God, and to you be the glory. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Yeah. Awesome. Okay, so this was Pastor Chris's, um, like points from last week. Study the truth, submit to the truth, speak the truth in love, and live the truth. Last week we talked about the belt of truth, if you are here. If not, there's your four points right there. You got it. And so um, this morning I actually want to talk about speaking the truth. Speaking the truth. And I want to talk about this because when we speak Verbally, when we verbally speak, there is power in that. Man, Pastor Herb's right. There's not a lot of room up here. That's funny. <laughs> okay, so if you would flip with me to Romans, please. Romans chapter 10, verses 9 through 10. Okay, and it says that if you confess with your mouth, that the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. And we see that word mouth twice, that if you confess with your mouth, and with the mouth confession is made. It doesn't say, if you just think about it in your heart enough and you don't say it verbally, like you're good. With your mouth, you must confess. And to me, it kind of it kind of is crazy to me that our mouth has the opportunity to save our souls. One of the greatest miracles with our mouth. That's a tool that God gave us. And it isn't just saying, but it's actually believing what our mouths are speaking too. There's a two part there. And I want us, if you want to flip with me, we're going to go into Luke now. We're going to be flipping a little bit today. I like the scripture. <laughs> Luke 6, uh, verse 45. It says, and this is so good. A good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth good. And an evil man out of the evil treasure of his heart brings forth evil. For out of the abundance of the heart, his mouth speaks. What is in our hearts? Right? Right? What are we speaking? Because whatever's coming out is what's on the inside. Just like when we confess with our mouth that Jesus is the Lord. That must be in our hearts for the Lord to see that, right? This weekend, Trevor and I went to a wedding. Pastor Chris had a super long week. We had a super fun weekend. We went to a wedding in Jamestown. And if you guys know about Jamestown, it's an interesting town. <laughs> like, there's a lot of darkness in it, I would say. And so we, we were in Jamestown. I'm going over my sermon. I'm sitting on a balcony. And um, I'm, I'm thinking about these verses. And I'm just sitting there, and I'm hearing people talk. I'm like, man, like, what's in their heart? And then the Lord's like, what's in your heart? I was like, hmm, true that. And so the Lord totally got me right there. He's like, what's in your heart? You know? And I began to think about my heart. And this weekend, Trevor and I had the opportunity to stay at the same hotel as all of the bridal party. And I'm just going to clear the air. No, we didn't sleep in the same bed. Okay. There's very strong boundaries. The purity patrol is on watch. That's another sermon for another time. We stayed with my friend Mackenzie. But I just to say all that, but we, we were staying at this hotel that was kind of already picked for the bridal party. So 
We're like, okay, we're going to this hotel. On the drive up, we learn that there is a, and hear me, a friendly ghost that lives at this hotel. And I was like, you have got to be kidding me. A friendly ghost, okay? And she has a name. And I'm just like, in my head, I'm like, okay, um, that's a demonic presence, thank you. Um, it's not a ghost, and she's not friendly just because she's living with you. You know what I mean? And her name's Flo, and I'm like, she can flow on out. Like, I'm not, not having it, not having it, not having it. And when I heard about this, initially, I was kind of, like, freaked out. I was like, what the heck? Like, ew, no, why would he stay somewhere like that? And Trevor's like, it's not a big deal. Like, in the name of Jesus, like, we're covered, you know? I'm like, yeah, you're right. And he's like, we're driving. He's like, and if that's not enough, he's like, I'm going to say, you want some more of that? In the name of Jesus. He's like, and I'll keep saying it. And that's all we have to do. And I was like, why was my response like fear almost? And his was authority. Like walking in the authority that God has given us, right? And it really like, and when I was thinking about my heart, I thought about that. I was like, why is it out of my heart that fear came and Trevor, he had victory in it. And, and I was thinking about it. And there's roots in our hearts. And when I was praying, I prayed that the roots of this sermon would go deep. There's roots in our hearts from things that have happened to us in our past, just experiences we've had. I have always gone to youth group. Every Wednesday night, I would go to youth group. It was just part of my routine and learning about the Lord. I grew up in the church, just kind of what I did. Well, seventh grade, I was going to a youth group. And I, and just a backstory, like, I grew up kind of sheltered and wasn't allowed to watch, like, Harry Potter and stuff. And so I didn't watch scary things at all. Like, none of it. My mom protected me and my dad, like, very strongly. Like, I did not watch any of that. Well, I walk into my youth group room and on the whiteboard says, like, demons and angels or something like that. I just remember it jarring me. Like, I walked in and I was terrified. I was like, what? Because I was in seventh grade and I was just like so pure on it on the inside. Like I'm so scared. And I walk in and our pastor begins to preach about this stuff. And come to find out he was basically like a Wiccan. Like he was basically like a man witch uh, before Christ saved his life. And he's talking about how like he has experienced like demonic presences and like they've attacked him and like all this stuff and I'm in seventh grade and like scarred for life and and the thing is like he neglected to tell us that the enemy's been defeated he neglected to say that and so I go home that night freaked out and just afraid literally afraid I'm like and some kids like go to sleep and they're afraid that like someone's gonna break into their house. I literally was afraid that I was gonna get attacked by a demonic presence. And I'm not kidding. Like that's the lie that the enemy told me when I was in seventh grade. Like I'm gonna get you. Like be careful. I'm gonna get you. And it was through high school that I walked through being afraid literally to sleep in my bed at night. How ridiculous. And so I go back to when Trevor um, was like victorious and I was a little bit fearful. I'm like geez, like, I'm still walking in that. Like, darn you, devil. You know what I mean? Like, he he's placed things in that have taken root, and we have to go through and speak the truth to those things to be like, no, you have nothing. You have no authority, period. You have nothing. And, and he used something that was supposed to be good at church, and he tainted it and made it ugly, and the enemy could do that. But the truth... It brings light to it. And it's like, really? You're nothing. And Trevor calls the enemy. He's like, he's a raisin. Like, eh. like he's a little <laughs> teensy, weensy little raisin. Like, he's nothing. And it's true. And it's not a secret that there's a battle going on all around us in the spiritual realm that we cannot actually physically see. We can't physically see it. Maybe we see, like, demons trying to manifest or stuff, like, through people, through anger or rage, or I was, my mom and I were in San Francisco, we picked up my wedding dress, and um, we saw this girl, and she just looked so empty, and, you know, you can't see the demonic presence, but you might as well have seen it, like, just the emptiness that this girl was walking with, like, it just kind of broke my heart, 
And so we can't see the things, but you kind of can. And sometimes we can even feel them. And we don't see the physical battle of an agent or a demon warring for my soul right here, but I'm, I'm pretty sure it's happening. And the tormenting and the pestering of the demons and trying to throw us off of our walk with God, like we don't see it, but it's happening, right? right. And maybe some of us feel the darkness or the light around us. We have discernment for that, right? And I want to put this image in your head. When I say, I spoke with my dad after I got off of work, and we just, like, had a conversation. I was talking with him. You have an image of me, like, verbally speaking with my dad. Like, we don't telecommunication, whatever. Like, we talk, right? Well, when I say, I spoke with my father in heaven, like, after I got off of work, you have an image of me praying. But am I praying verbally, or am I praying in my mind to God, right. Right? right? Because the thing is, we can't see these things, but when we speak, they hear it. Right. In our minds, when we think, they don't hear it. But when we speak, they do. So why do we speak to these things non-verbally? Why do we do that? When they're right next to us, when the war is at our front door or in your home, and it's in our mind. We're like, God, I just pray that, like in our minds, God, I pray that you would just deliver my so-and-so from this. And God's like, speak it. Yeah. Use the authority of your mouth. Yeah. Our mouth has the power to save our soul. It's got the power to get that thing out of your front door too, yeah. right? Yeah. Okay, so I recently moved out. <laughs> I'm 25. I recently moved out, okay? It was a big step. And um, I moved out into an old dairy home. And like when, when I moved in there, Trevor's gonna move in after we get married, but the walls were like a dark beige and I'm more of like a clean white crisp kind of gal, like walls. And so Trevor helped me paint and we painted the walls white, like in the bedroom. And then um, we also had like five people come, thank you, Pastor Chris, and pray over our house. And so, like, what do these two things have in common? Like, painting a house and praying for a house. We change the atmosphere of that place. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can change the atmosphere of a place by painting the walls. If the walls in here were black, it'd feel pretty somber, right? But they're nice and light and airy. The same thing happens when we pray. The atmosphere will change. And so we had people come over, anoint the house, pray over it, because... I wasn't sleeping very well at night, and I was kind of just irritated. I was like, what is going on? And now when I, when I sleep at night, I literally don't want to get up. Like, it's so peaceful. I'm like this. Like, I look forward to going to my home. And it's because we prayed over it, not because I painted the walls. You know what I mean? Like, it's because we prayed over it. And the Lord changed the atmosphere of that home. This house is like over 100 years old. Who knows what's been in it? But now I know that the Holy Spirit's in it and nothing else is. So we're good. Okay? So, thanks. Thank you. Okay. So, praying. We walked through the house. And when we walked through the house and prayed, we weren't like, hmm. Like, we were praying. Okay? Like, in the name of Jesus. And, like, proclaiming. And, and all these things. Because our words have power. Right? So, Matthew um, chapter 18, verses 19 through 20, it says, again, I say to you that if two of you agree on earth concerning anything they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, I am in the midst of them. Okay? Agree. This word agree. Again, I say to you that if two of you agree on earth, this word means to sound together, to be in accord, in harmony. When something is like harmonious, we hear it. We can hear the harmony. We can hear the melody. Same thing here. He needs to hear it. Metaf metaphorically, the word means to agree together in prayer. That's what it means. In prayer that is concordant, which means it's going together. Again, I say to you that if two of you pray in agreement with your mouths on the earth concerning anything, that's what that translation is really looking at right there. We need to speak it. We need to pray in agreement. 
And we weren't praying in our minds, like I said, we were praying aloud. And why? Because I want to really hone in on this. The things fighting for our souls cannot hear our thoughts. And the angels, the demons, they cannot hear our thoughts. The devil, he cannot hear your thoughts. Satan is not omnipotent, meaning all-powerful. He is not omnis omniscient, meaning all-knowing. And he is not omnipresent, meaning everywhere. I don't know about you, but that was something that I didn't really know. I assumed I heard a lie that he could hear what I was thinking. And I felt like my thoughts weren't safe. But he can't because he's a liar. And he likes to make you believe things that aren't true, right? right. He really loves to try and exalt himself above God or to the position of God. But he's not omniscient. He's not omnipresent. He can't do any of that. All he can do is lie. And that is what he was doing. And so I want us to really know that when we speak, we have to speak. Because then he can hear the things that we're saying, no devil, get out of my house. Amen. He can't hear it when you're saying it in your mind. Yeah, he yeah. cannot. Yeah. And in Matthew 2.13, uh, I'm just going to go to it real quick. Well, I'll just talk about it. Um, this was what was happening was Jesus was born and Herod was trying to kill baby Jesus. Okay. Why? Well, because there was probably a spirit of murder trying to go around and kill Jesus because the enemy knew what Jesus was about. Right. But the thing is the enemy couldn't find him. And this just confirms like he doesn't know. He doesn't know. He can't see it. If he would have known where Jesus was, he would have killed him. But he can't read our thoughts. He can't be everywhere at once. He's a raisin, okay? <laughs> and so he can't. He's been defeated already. And when we use our mouths to proclaim the truth, it changes things and it frees people. Our words hold power. Proverbs 18.21. Life and death are in the power of the, uh -huh. the tongue when we speak. When we speak, we have authority. Luke 10, 19 through 20. Behold, I love this verse. I give you the authority to trample on serpents and scorpions and over all of the power of the enemy and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Amen. Raisin. We must pray aloud. He has no authority. He cannot hear our thoughts. Um, and I, I'm going to skip a little bit because I honor you guys and want you to get out of here on time. Um, but I'm going to leave you guys with these. Please grab your phone and take a picture of these verses because these will change your home, because these will change your life, because when we speak with the authority that God has given us, we can change things. And when we pray, I, we'll be getting into that later. I'm sure Pastor Chris is like, hey, you're still on some of my sermon, like, <laughs> because the armor of God, right? But this isn't exactly a piece of armor, but our tongue is powerful. And I felt like we needed to hone in on this. And so when we pray, when we speak, we need to speak the truth verbally. We need to speak the truth verbally. If something is coming against you and you're feeling it, in the name of Jesus, that thing has no power, no dominion. Get out of here. You speak it, and it changes. And I promise you, you will feel a difference in the atmosphere. I'm not kidding. But these verses are truth. And there's, man, you could just put the whole Bible and like, be like, take a picture of that. But these are really awesome verses, and I want you guys to have these to be able to go through. Because they're truth, they walk in authority, and... Like I said, like they will change things. So I want to leave you with two things. These verses and the authority to speak over the things that the enemy has been trying to take. Whether it even be a blessing that he's given you, that God's given you. The enemy will try and take anything and lie and steal and slither and be gross. But we have the authority to stomp on his head. <laughs> okay? One time, I'll leave you with a story. One time, I, I was backtrack. I was going to school to be a nurse. I changed it. I was like, I know that I'm called to be in ministry. So 
I'm like really getting involved in stuff like that and I feel like I'm starting to get sick. And I know the enemy doesn't have power over everything. I'm not going to give him credit where he doesn't deserve it, right? But I could tell that it was a spiritual attack and I was getting sick. And it made me mad. I was like, how dare you? Like, try and come against my health. Like, how, who do you think you are? And I was walking out to my car, and I literally went like this. I was like, and I, like I was so mad. And, like, I think you guys need to get to that point where it's like, you have no authority over me, over my family, over my future kids. Come on. Like, he has nothing. And so if you need to walk out of your house and stomp on his head and your your neighbors think you're crazy, who cares? Like, like who cares? Because you know where you're going at the end of the day and you know who's trying to come against you. And they don't, and they need to know that, right? And there was another time when we were, I was in my house and I was, uh, my parents' house and I was praying and I was anointing the house because I just felt like there was a lot of junk. I was like, we're done, like we're done. And so I got my anointing oil out. I was praying over the house. I was like, "Mm mm-mm. And I literally opened the front door and I said, get out, get out. And I'm sure my neighbors probably think I'm crazy because like when I worship, I open all the windows and I do not care. And our our houses are close together. And so they probably hear me, but people need to know like that we have authority, the enemy needs to know, you're not worried about being bold. Okay, we can be bold on Facebook, we can be bold over a phone. Let's be bold in love and tell the enemy to get, get on and get. Okay, so I hope this sermon uh, gave you guys some authority because that's what the word says. It says that we have authority and we're blood bought. And the enemy has nothing, not even an inch, not a centimeter, nothing. So don't give him a foothold and tell him to cut it off verbally, if you would pray with me. Father God, I thank you, man, for sending your son to the cross, because if you didn't, we wouldn't have this authority. Lord, I thank you that you saved my soul, and because of that, I have the authority, God. It's nothing that I could have done, God, but it is all you hallelujah god we give you the glory and i just pray that everyone would walk out of here lord knowing who they are in you not in who they need to be in themselves god but it is in you and nothing else lord i pray that our flesh would bow to the name of jesus god and the holy spirit would come through us god and just live live fully and freely god in our lives and i pray we would be obedient to you we wouldn't be afraid to be bold in a street, God, in a in a anywhere, God. If you're calling us to do something and to be, man, a light for you, God, I pray that we would. I pray we wouldn't be afraid to be bold in love and speak your truth, God. Man, thank you, Father God. This is your service, Lord. Thank you for moving and for speaking. In the mighty name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Shelby. That was awesome. That was awesome. Aren't you glad that you're part of a a denomination that lets women preach? Some of these people. Anyway, shouldn't have gone there. Uh, (laughs) It's funny that she was talking about that because I was at uh, our our minister's conference this week, and uh, there was a gentleman who's been on this platform about a year ago, Jeremy Anderson, he is a missionary to Hawaii, believe it or not, to the college campus there, University of Hawaii, and I got to sit with him, and as we were just worshiping there at uh, Trinity, the youth know where this is at, this is where your youth con was at, and so you know, so the power was flowing, and he just comes up to me, and he said, Chris, I want you to know that you have authority every time you speak, when you speak into somebody's life, over it, and sometimes we forget that. Sometimes yeah. even we as ministers forget that there is power, and so that's an important thing that we have authority. And it's funny at this the the last three days, it was with these gospel music groups, and there was somebody who was just having some intense pain in his neck, and he was just struggling to sing. And I said, "Let's just go over here to this corner, and start praying." Yeah. We started praying, and we spoke it out. And he went up to sing, He and he told me later, he says, he went up to sing, and when he was done, he just went to the back crying because he knew 
that God was working, not just healing here, but healing, you know, on the inside, saying, instead of him questioning, God, why are you doing this? Man, he was healing the relationship. God was healing that relationship. And so listen, there are power in our words. This is a great message. Take these verses. Why don't you read them this afternoon? That would be awesome. We're going to release you so that all these people at the street fair could have better parking spots really quick. Um, but uh, thank you for coming. If we could all stand and we'll close. Father, thank you for this amazing message uh, from Shelby. Uh, and thank you for what Trevor was able to deliver today. And Lord, uh, we are praying for both of these ministries. And Lord, I pray that even now that you move in the hearts of the people who are here today to support, financially support Trevor and what he does. Lord, we know that the idol of America today is sports. And Lord, today we are... We are casting that out. We're not, we're not saying that, that it's evil, but what we're saying, Lord, is we want you in the center of everything. We want the, you in the center of our families, in the center of our church, and we want in the center of our sports. When we do something, we want you to be the center, and Trevor's pointing these kids in the right direction, and so, Lord, we want to support them. Lord, I pray that we, we are moved to support him financially, as this church is about to support him financially. And Lord, I pray that, that in this moment that we understand that when we speak words in your name, in the powerful name of Jesus, that things happen. And so, Lord, we, I pray that the Holy Spirit is moving in each and every one of us and that we recognize what we have, the gift from you, these words of authority. Lord, I pray that you bless those who have come, deliver us, and we pray this all. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Thanks for coming. Go and serve your king.